to, to lead the way in the development of a new clean Order, industry. Order, Senator Small. You will be in continuation when debate resumes. It being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. Senator, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. Um, Michael McCormack, uh, until other swearing in processes are in place. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Who's going to be on the Thank you, Mr. President. Is Mr. Morrison's preference for net zero by 2050 the position of the Morrison Joyce government? Senator Reynolds. Uh, the position has not changed. The Prime Minister overseas, and uh, again, the Foreign Minister yesterday uh, has made it very clear. Order. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When asked whether the Nationals' party room would be supportive of net zero, uh, Mr Pitt said, and I quote, I think they'd be unsupportive. Is it Deputy Prime Minister-elect Mr Joyce's intention to make the Nationals' opposition to net zero emission part of the coalition agreement? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for the question. This government has been very clear that we want to get to net zero as quickly as possible. This is a global problem in need of a solution that works right across the world. Uh, we need to make net zero practically achievable for us all, and we are taking action now to get the technologies right that enable us to get there. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Minister Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is not only securing our country's economic future, but has ensured that more Australians are in work today than ever before? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Small for the question. And in doing so, I of course acknowledge uh, that he is an employer. He knows what it's like to have sleepless nights, and he also knows what it's like to be able to embrace the Morrison government's policies uh, to ensure that he is able to expand his business and employ more staff. Mr. President, the Morrison Order. government's plan for Australia, our economic plan, it is giving businesses the confidence they need to employ more Australians. And we saw this last week when the Labor force figures for Order. May Order. were handed Senator down. Cash, please resume your seat. I, Senator Watt, I'm going to be strict on you this week. You have incessantly and continuously interjected. It's only Monday at 2.05. I need to be able to hear Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And only just last week, what we saw with the labour force figures being handed down was that unemployment in Australia dropped by 0.4 points to 5.1 per cent. And in fact, that is lower than when Labor was last in office. When they were last in office in August 2013, it was 5.8 per cent. We also saw employment figures that well exceeded the market expectations, with 115,000 more Australians in work in the month of May. What we've also seen is seven months of continuous employment growth, and there are now 130,000 more Australians in work than we had prior to COVID-19. We also have record female employment, with 6,255,000 females in work across Australia, and we have 97,500 more females employed prior that more than prior to the pandemic. We also have, Mr President, record male employment with 6,870,200 in work across Australia, and that's actually 32,900 more males in employment than prior to COVID-19. We've also seen Australians putting up their hands and saying they have confidence in the labour market with the participation rate rising 0.3 percentage points to 66.2 per cent. So, Mr President, we're putting in place the right economic policies to help Order. businesses to employ Senator Cash. more Australians. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And because I'm sure the Minister's not done yet, 
Can I ask how this government is backing small businesses and Australian employers to create more jobs, not only now but into the future? Order. Order. I'll call Senator Cash when, I, when there's silence. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, as Senator Small knows, as a small business person himself, the Morrison government's economic plan is backing businesses and it's giving them the confidence they need to take on new staff. Mr. President, we know that businesses create jobs, not just government, but businesses. Governments put in place the policy frameworks for businesses to lever off, to prosper, grow, and to create more jobs for Australians, which is certainly what we are seeing under our government. Our expensing measures and our loss carry back measures. They're helping businesses reinvest in themselves. We're backing those businesses who have the capacity to invest in themselves. We're saying to them, invest in your business, grow your business and employ more Australians. We also see business confidence now at a record high and we're also seeing business investment continuing to grow. And what this shows is that the Morrison government is putting in place the right economic framework, the right economic policies across Australia to help businesses prosper, grow Order. and create Cash. more jobs. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government supporting Australians of all ages to gain new skills and therefore secure jobs now and into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, our government is backing Australians to gain, in particular, new skills right across the economy. The Morrison government invested around $7 billion in skills last year to help Australia's pipeline of skilled workers. In this year's budget, we have continued our support to back Australians to upskill and reskill, and in particular, we have expanded our boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, providing an additional $2.4 billion, and which has now seen more than 157,000 apprentices come on board and find a place in around 60,000 businesses across Australia. That's a good thing, Mr President, putting in place the right policy incentives so that businesses are able to take on a new apprentice and create new jobs for Australians. We're also expanding access for Australians to free or low cost training by again working with the states and territories and increasing capacity in our job Order, trainer Senator fund. Cash. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. When asked whether net zero by 2050 is a position of the Morrison government, the Minister for Foreign Affairs said on Insiders on Sunday, and I quote, it is the clear position that the PM has articulated. Is net zero by 2050 a position of the Morrison-Joyce government? Yes or no? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President, and I thank Senator Keneally for her question. Indeed, as the Prime Minister has made clear, it is important for Australia to drive towards net zero emissions, to play its role in terms of the development of new technologies, to invest in technologies, not taxes, as those opposite would have, uh, have, to make sure that in doing so, Australia, which has been such a crucial leader in relation to energy sources in the past, continues to be a crucial leader in the delivery of energy sources now and into the future. That's why, Mr President, that's why, Mr President, Whilst Order. at the G7 and associated meetings, the Prime Minister was furthering on the policy commitments made in terms of the Order. pursuit of hydrogen hubs around the country, the pursuit of the target, the stretch target to achieve hydrogen delivered at $2 per kilogram, and to make sure that we have strong international partnerships in that regard. The Prime Minister Order. pursued agreements whilst overseas and signed them with Germany and Singapore for hydrogen cooperation with those key economies and key investors Order. in Australia, Senator as Green. we have done and pursued with Japan as well. And it's this type of investment, this type of investment by coalition governments that has enabled Australia to reduce its emissions, not with the taxes of those proposed opposite. Order. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Relevance. The, the question was fairly tight and clear. Is net zero a position of the Morrison-Joyce government, yes or no? I can't instruct the minister the terms in which he 
or she must answer the question. As long as the minister is directly relevant to it, and I think the minister is clearly being directly relevant to it, there's a chance after question time to debate, debate ministers' answers. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, Australia beat its Kyoto-era targets by some 459 million tonnes. Australians' emissions are down over 20 per cent from the period 2005 to December 2020, and that's compared with an OECD average of 6.6 per cent. This is what achieves a pathway to net zero by achieving real emissions reductions through real investment in real technologies. Order. Order. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Payne also said that net zero by 2050 is, quote, the broad position of the Australian really? government and, quote, a sensible position. Is what net zero that? by 2050 a position that was agreed by the Morrison McCormick cabinet? If so, will it be revised by the Morrison Joyce cabinet? You bet your bottom dollar. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, it is a sensible position. It is a sensible position and it is an important position for Australia to play our role, but most crucially for Australia to ensure that we continue to drive the investment and attract the investment in the technologies that will get us towards net zero, but do so whilst protecting the jobs and businesses and livelihoods of Australians. And that will for all, for all, forever remain the coalition government's priority, the projection of the protection of jobs and businesses across Australia, ensuring that we make sure those businesses can operate with the technology, with the support, with the investment. Senator Wong on a point of order. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mr President, uh, uh, the point of order is direct relevance, and I understand the position you have previously articulated. Senator Keneally's question, though, was a direct question about what the position of the Cabinet was. Uh, and the, min the, the, minister, the, the minister saying, you know, giving us a long lecture about how you might approach a target that when the question is only whether or not the target is, is his government's position. I mean, we are, we are having a discussion about direct relevance on a question to the leader of the government in the Senate about what right, the Senator government's Wong, I've, position I've, I've, is. I'll add you to remind the minister of the second part. I, I thought the minister engaged with that at the start. He's got 16 seconds remaining, but he is also entitled to address the quotation that was used in the question and remain directly relevant to the question. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I was asked whether it was a sensible position, Order. and I said... Order. Senator Keneally. I'm sorry, direct relevance. Uh, the minister says he was asked if it was a sensible sorry. position. He was not. Sorry, he Senator was asked if it was a position I allowed, of his government. I allowed, I allowed the Leader of the Opposition to, to restate the question in some detail. Um, the, 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 the minister is entitled to address any or all parts of a question. Senator Birmingham. I was asked whether the position as articulated by the Foreign Minister, that it was a sensible position, is the government's position. Of course it is the government's position, Mr President. Of course it is, and the government is determined to make sure Order. we continue Senator to Birmingham. drive investment into... Time for the answer has expired. The... Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In an op-ed in The Australian in February, Nationals leader Barnaby Joyce wrote, and I quote, the Nationals have always oppo been opposed to a net zero target. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. Will Mr Morrison rule out abandoning his preference for net zero emissions by 2050 in any revised coalition agreement? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, the Prime Minister has made clear the government's position. I am confident the government's position in relation to supporting investment in driving towards net zero and seeking to achieve that, in seeking to achieve that as quickly Order. as is possible and practical, Order. whilst not applying taxes like those opposite would, whilst instead investing in the technologies that are necessary to get those outcomes, Order. remains indeed the position. Now I note the new leader of the Nationals was asked about this very matter in his press conference prior to, uh, prior, just immediately prior to question time. And Mr Joyce made clear that he'd be consulting with his party room, having discussions, having discussions Order. with the Prime Minister. But I assure the Order Senate and Senator Keneally as well, Mr President, 
The government has made clear and the Prime Minister has made clear Australia's position in international discussions to the Australian people. That remains the position, Mr President. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to Australia's outstanding Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the minister outline to the Senate what the Morrison government has done to ensure superannuation works harder for all Australians? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Scar Senator for this very Ayers. important question. Mr President, the Australian Senator superannuation Ayers. system manages over $3 trillion in Senator retirement Reddick. savings on behalf of 16 million Australians. Australians pay around $30 billion a year in superannuation fees, more than $27 billion uh, more than the $27 billion uh, million dollars that households spend on energy bills and the $12 billion that they spend on water bills. These on, those on this side of the chamber are ensuring that superannuation works harder for all Australians. All Australians, Order. all reforms since coming to government, have been putting billions back into the pockets of Australians' retirement, giving Australians choice and making the superannuation system transparent for the first time, protecting your super, capping fees on low balances and reuniting small and inactive accounts to active ones, putting members' interests first, removing inappropriate insurances from young people that erodes their balances. And now I'm very proud that we have passed the Your Future, Your Super package, opposed by those opposite, that will create efficiencies, reduce costs and remove duplication in the superannuation system. The package is the Morrison government's next step towards modernising and improving the superannuation system to ensure that it works harder for all Australians. Treasury estimates that this package will add around $17.9 billion to Australian superannuation balances over the next decade, and it will do so in four ways. When you change job, your superannuation will follow you. A new online super comparison tool covering performance and fees will make it easier to find the best super fund for you. There will be clear standards for performance, and when clarifying that funds that funds have to act in your best financial interest. For too long, some funds have relied on people not knowing what they're up to. With the Morrison government's reforms, they won't be able to get away with the rip-off any longer. Senator Hume, yeah. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate what the government has done to ensure Australians are not forced, forced into duplicate accounts? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. The Treasury estimates that around 6 million multiple accounts are held by 4.4 million Australians. Now, to address this, from 1 November 2021, when you change jobs, your superannuation fund will move with you. And if you don't know your superannuation details, your employer will check with the ATO to find your active super account. So no more accidentally doubling up your fees, doubling up your insurance premiums and losing money to super accounts that you didn't even know existed. It's important to note, Mr President, that thanks to the coalition government, you still have choice. You will always have choice. Your super fund will now move with you, but you have the option to change that fund at any time. If your fund is underperforming, you can seek a fund with lower fees. You're able to do this. Your employer can't stop you, because, and nor will this measure. Treasury estimates that this change will increase superannuation savings by around $2.8 billion over the next decade, straight back into the retirement funds of hardworking Australians. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Yeah. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what the government is doing to hold underperforming accounts or funds to account? Senator Hume. Mr President, super funds have an important job, and that is to grow Australians' retirement savings. Though all too often, when a fund has underperformed, members either don't find out about it or they don't know that they're underperforming. They've been able to hide behind the skirts of the good performing funds. In fact, around $100 billion of Australians' money is in underperforming superannuation products, and around 3 million superannuation accounts are in underperforming superannuation products. The Productivity Commission estimates that once your future, your super measures kick in, approximately 25 of the current 80 or so My Super products will fail the performance test. Mr President, the Labor Party may have introduced superannuation to Australia, but by goodness, it's taken a coalition government to make it work in the interest of members rather than super fund managers. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr President. Order. Order on my left. 
Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. The proposed changes to Standard 3 of the Australian Charities and Not for Profit Commission Regulation of 2013 have been labelled by the Law Council as unnecessary and cumbersome and inconsistent with the objects of the ACNC Act. Others say these regulations will have a chilling effect on the lawful policy advocacy by charities. They, are buried, they will bury them in red tape and stop charities from working to improve the lives of Australians. Why is the government making these changes? Why shouldn't the sector see this as an attack on the, uh, as an attack on the ability for them to advocate? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. I thank uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Seward for um, for her question. Um, it, <laughs> it is always nice to get uh, to get a detailed policy question, although although sometimes um, although sometimes when uh, when it is particularly precise detail, uh, it uh, it can be a challenge to be able to provide the granular information that the senator may wish to uh, to receive in response initially. Uh, Mr. President, uh, look, I'll take the senator's question on notice and, uh, and provide a swift response to the chamber for her. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. I thought that was a fairly simple question. It was about why are you doing it? The government claims this is implementing the recommendations of the ACNC expert panel, when the panel actually explicitly recommended that that standard be repealed. How is this implementing the recommendation if the council said or the expert panel said it should be repealed? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, th thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, for Senator Seward, but I don't have a copy of the recommendation uh, in front of me, uh, or uh, or indeed the detail in terms of the uh, in terms of the Order. response. Um, I am happy to provide for the senator as much information as, uh, as I can on notice in relation to the specific issue that, uh, that she has raised uh, and will endeavour to do so as promptly as we can. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. The proposed changes allow the ACNC Commissioner to make judgments on potentially unlawful activities by charities. If a charity breaks the law, shouldn't it be dealt with under the criminal law and in fact, in fact under Standard 5? Senator Birmingham. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, I mean, certainly, if laws are broken, then it ought to be handled under criminal law. Equally, uh, if laws are broken in the administration and operation of a charity, then I would imagine that uh, that Australians would expect there should be consequences for the operation of the charity itself as well. Uh, so, uh, so, Mr. President, uh, again, I'm happy to provide further detail in responding to Senator Seward, uh, given I don't have full information on, uh, on the specific issues she's raised before me. However, Order, I, Senator I appreciate Seward. Senator Seward uh, would like to debate the issue right now, uh, and I apologise to her that, uh, that I don't have uh, the information that she would wish uh, to detail right now, but I will undertake, as I have, to make sure I provide those details back to the Chamber. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today the Prime Minister held an emergency National Cabinet meeting with the sole agenda item being the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Liberal New South Wales Premier Berejiklian has said she will request more supply of vaccines from the Commonwealth, saying, and I quote, if we had more doses of Pfizer, we could get them out through our New South Wales state government mass vaccination hubs. Why has the Morrison government failed to ensure enough supply of Pfizer doses in New South Wales, which is now facing a new COVID-19 outbreak? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank Senator for the question. Uh, Senator's correct. There was a national cabinet meeting held this morning with the primary uh, issue on the agenda, the national vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and, at, and at that meeting this morning, uh, the Coordinator General of Operation COVID Shield, L Lieutenant General uh, Fruin, provided each state and territory uh, with planning projections of Pfizer and AstraZeneca doses for their jurisdictions uh, over the remainder of this year, Mr. President. So that, the, 
states and territories can effectively plan their vaccine rollout, Mr. President. The Coordinator General confirmed that um, Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccinations uh, allocations are being provided on a proportional population basis, so that each state and territory, uh, uh, to each state, to each, uh, uh, Mr. President, and the government. Uh, remains on track to offer every eligible Australian uh, a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine by the end of 2021. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Victoria's acting Premier James Molino has warned the country is headed into winter without enough supply of COVID-19 vaccines and has slammed the national vaccine rollout as an, and I quote, absolute shambles. Can the minister guarantee that the Morrison government will supply sufficient doses to meet demand for each week through July? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. As I've just indicated, uh, state premiers and territory leaders were updated this morning on the supply projections for COVID-19 vaccines out to the end of 2021. Mr. President, uh, the state leaders uh, agreed that they would continue to prioritise uh, Category 1A and 1B and the, uh, vac uh, people seeking vaccines during that period of time, Mr. President. Uh, and so, uh, so, so, Mr. President, uh, we, we will continue to work cooperatively with the states and territories on the national vaccine rollout to ensure that Australians, uh, as we've indicated, have the opportunity to get a first dose of the vaccine by the end of 2021. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. When New South Wales and Victoria are experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks and the Morrison government's vaccine rollout is an absolute shambles, why is the Morrison-Joyce government more focused on rolling each other than rolling out the vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Order. Order. Mr. Mr. President. Order. Senator Colbeck, I'll ask you to resume your seat till there's the chamber extends a courtesy of silence to you on both sides. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as is clearly demonstrated by the Prime Minister calling a national cabinet meeting this morning to specifically discuss the vaccine rollout demonstrates the Prime Minister and the government's focus on the vaccine rollout. That was the point of having the meeting to discuss with the states and territories the rollout of the vaccination process, Mr President. And we will continue to uh, maintain that focus, Mr President. The Prime Minister will continue to maintain that focus. The whole purpose of the discussion this morning was to ensure that the states and territories had the information available to them that they needed to coordinate the supply and, and the rollout of the vaccination process so that every Australian who wants a vaccine by the end of the year can get one. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to Senator Reynolds as Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Minister, in 2011, the Productivity Commission estimated a national disability insurance scheme would cover 411,000 participants at a gross cost of $13.6 billion when fully implemented. A half a percentage point rise in the Medicare levy was introduced in the 2013 budget to help fund it. It is now forecast that the cost of the scheme will rise to a staggering $30 billion plus by 24-25, with a projected 530,000 participants costing more than Medicare costs for the whole nation and could blow out to $130 billion by the 2030s. Minister, what is the government going to do to rein in the cost of the NDIS so that it is sustainable and affordable to taxpayers? Order. The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question, and I also thank her for her passion and commitment uh, to this extraordinary, globally unique scheme. The Australian government is ensuring that this, this world-first scheme 
Uh, and remember, it is, this is a scheme for people with significant and permanent disabilities, and we are doing everything we can to ensure that that continues for many generations to come. Today, there are 450,000 Australians on the NDIS, 50% uh, of those for the first time. And as Senator Hanson has said, that is a significant increase over what was anticipated in 2011, both in terms of the number of participants and the average cost of uh, the packages. So we've, not only have we seen more people enter the scheme, which again I think says so much about the goodness in Australians, their, their heart and their ability and their commitment to pay for this, but it also does mean uh, that we have sustainability issues now with the scheme, Senator Hanson. So the average payment per participant has increased by almost 48 per cent over the last three years alone, and that is a 12.5 per cent increase every year, which, as all of us in this chamber know, is not a sustainable growth trajectory uh, for the taxpayers into the future. Now, the NDIS will always be fully funded under the Morrison government, which is why over the last two budgets alone we have made a commitment of an additional $17.1 billion—$17,000 million to actually fully fund the NDIS over the forward estimates. And this takes the total investment in the NDIS to $121 billion over the next four years, which, as Senator Hanson has said, will make it more expensive now for taxpayers Order. than Medicare. Senator Reynolds. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Unlike other government benefits, there is no means testing of recipients of NDIS assistance. Is it fair that people on other benefits are means tested while people on NDIS, regardless of income or wealth, are not? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator Hanson, for the question. Uh, it's important for everybody in this chamber uh, and also for those watching or listening to realise that the NDIS is a social insurance scheme and it is not a welfare scheme. The NDIS is a way of providing individualised support for people with disabilities, their families and also their carers. This means support provided are related to a person's disability and the support that they need, and it's not uh, directly related to their capacity to pay for support. Now, the NDIS was based on the principles of fairness and equality, meaning that your postcode or your socioeconomic circumstances or your means to pay for medical reports should not matter. But sadly, today it still does, and we have much work to do together to actually make sure that that's the case. For example, in the Senator's own home state of Queensland, the average Order. planned budget Senator is 76000 while in Brisbane, has expired. 88000 Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, I've been advised that under current arrangements, sex worker therapy, that's prostitutes, could cost the taxpayer anything between $400 million and $2 billion each year. Minister, if this is correct, what is the hourly rate for the service? Because I've got the current price guide and I can't find where it costs an hourly rate for it as a, a prostitute. So could you please advise, is that, could that be the cost to the taxpayers and, why are, and what are Order. we paying Senator an hour? Hanson. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, again, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, my predecessor, the Minister for the NDIS, has already uh, discussed this issue at some length and clarified the government's position on this. We do not believe that the use of taxpayer fund NDIS funds should be used for the service of a sex worker because we don't believe that is in line with community expectations. Nor should we, the NDIS pay for what might otherwise be considered an ordinary living expense. We do recognise that people with disability should be supported to have control over and choices about access to service that pertain to their sexuality to enable them to live an ordinary life. However, should an NDIS participant feel that they need to purchase such services, it should be purchased using their personal income. Reasonable and necessary support must come, we believe, with some boundaries. And I notice that this has uh, bipartisan support, 
and that Mr Shorten has Order. recently endorsed Senator the Reynolds. government's approach Time on this position. Time the answer has expired. Senator Van. Thank you. And my question is also to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting people with motor neurone disease through the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Van for his question on this most important of issues and one that I know unites everybody in this chamber. Today is Motor Neuron Disease Global Day, and on today we recognise and we also shine a light on motor neuron disease, a cruel and unrelenting degenerative disease. MND is represented by a blue cornflower, which is a symbol of hope, a fragile appearance but hardy in nature. This morning I attended the MND Global Day event here in Parliament House. There I had the privilege to hear Sharon and Peter share their personal journeys with MDS. Seven-year-old Harrison did a wonderful job speaking on behalf of his mother, Sharon, who no longer is able to personally to share her story. Sharon shared her journey since diagnosis at the age of only 34 on her life, her work, her aspirations for herself and a family. Sharon herself described her journey with MND as a nightmare, a journey in which she is seeking as much control as possible so she can provide as normal a life as possible for her husband Adam and for her sons Harrison and Hayden. Peter spoke of the need for hope despite being diagnosed with MSD how, and how he could maximise control of his life and also the quality of life for him and his family. Now, hope for a cure still remains so elusive, which means we must keep working together to ensure that people with MND and their families have quick and ready access to the supports they need. And this is why NDIS has prioritised people with MND to seek access for the supports that they need, with claims now being completed within five days. The NDI continues to work with the MND associations nationally to ensure that people have the flexible and timely supports, Order. in particular Senator AT, Reynolds, that they need. The answer has expired. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I was, uh, I'm sure everyone would join in welcoming uh, uh, Neil Danaher getting an AO last weekend. Can the minister explain the importance of timely and flexible access to assistive technology and resources for those with MND? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, and again I thank Senator Van uh, for the question. As we all know, the degenerative progression of MND is rapid and it is unrelenting. They call it the thousand-day disease. So therefore, more flexible assistive technology options is absolutely essential, particularly access to loan equipment to ensure people with MND uh, can get the AT that they need as soon as they need it. Now, I congratulate the MND associations in Australia who are leading the way to provide assistive technology loan libraries for their members. These schemes Order, have been Senator so Chisholm. successful that the NDIA last week released an RFI to test. Sorry, Mr. President. I'll, Senator Chisholm, I called you to order already. Senator Reynolds. So on, on an issue like this, a bit of respect at least. Order. So these Senator, schemes order on my set order please resume your seat Senator Reynolds I've asked at the start of question time for people to restrain themselves and I've also reminded senators that when I use their name I expect them to remain silent for a while Senator Reynolds thank you and I again congratulate the uh, Australian MND associations for leading the way in this space to provide assistive technology loan libraries the scheme has been so Order. successful that the NDI Time is now the looking to do that has for expired. children. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what other resources are available to support people with MND and their families, including planning for end of life? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. While the blue cornflower does symbolise hope for people with MND, the sad reality still is today that MND is a terminal illness. So it's important, therefore, for people with MND, their families and their carers to have access to sensitive information and helpful information about the journey that lies ahead. This is why Order. I also... 
Order, Senator Chisholm. You're free to. I, have, I haven't called you to order, Senator Reynolds. You're free to continue. This is why. This Senator is why Chisholm. today. I also announced the release of an end-of-life guide for people living with MND. Being able to plan ahead can reduce the stress for not only those with MND but their families and carers to give them more control over the remainder of their lives. It is not something any of us like to think about, but this planning is important. And can I congratulate MND Australia and also Department of Social Services who have provided the resources uh, for Order. this Senator sadly Reynolds. necessary guide. Time for and the thank answer you. has expired. Senator Still. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Last week, the Minister was asked why the Morrison government failed to secure an early agreement for Pfizer vaccines when it had the chance some 12 months ago. The Minister took this on notice. So today, Minister, can you inform the Senate of that? Your answer, please. Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Stirl, for the question. You're correct. I have taken the question on notice. Uh, and a, an answer to that question is being prepared and will be provided to the Chamber. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the Minister confirm that by the time Australia took delivery of its first shipment of Pfizer, at least 44 other countries had already began inoculating their citizens with Pfizer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, Australians would recall that what, what occurred in this country is that we took a very deliberate approach to the rollout and the approval of vaccines. We didn't, as happened in many other countries, Mr. President, have emergency Order. approvals for the vaccine rollout. We waited. And, and, and asked our approval agencies to fully approve the vaccines before we started administering them. We took advantage of the experience in previous countries, in other countries, Order. to understand what was happening with the vaccines and for that data to be utilised as a part of our approval process, Mr. President. So we took a, a process. We took a process where Senator we could Mayors. be able to say to the Australian people that we have undergone a full and thorough assessment of each of the vaccines before they were approved, Order. Mr President. And I think that that was an appropriate thing for us to do. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question? Yes, I do. Thanks, Mr President. Order. Minister, how many sorry, Pfizer Senator, doses— Sorry, stop the clock. I can't hear Senator Stirl. That's unusual, isn't it? You, Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr President. How many Pfizer doses per week will the Commonwealth guarantee from today until the end of July 2021? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, that information with respect to the number of doses available of both Pfizer and AstraZeneca was provided to state and territory premiers uh, as a part of the National Cabinet meeting this morning, Mr President. Order. I, Mr. Order. President, I am happy. I am happy to provide that information to the, uh, to the Chamber and I will come back to the Chamber as soon as possible with that information because that information hasn't been given to me Order. off the back of the National Cabinet meeting this morning. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the Morrison government's commitment to ensuring more older Australians can live at home for longer. The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thank you to Senator Henderson for the question. Mr President, the Morrison government has a strong track record of supporting senior Australians, and it has been strengthened through our $17.7 billion investment in aged care announced in the budget. The government understands that many senior Australians want to live at home for longer and we are boosting entry-level support services with an additional $112 million in investment in the Commonwealth Home Support Program. The latest allocation of funding will provide more access to a range of high-demand care services, including meals, transport, social support, respite, gardening and cleaning for older Australians, their families and for their carers, Mr President. The recent budget includes $6.5 billion 
to deliver an additional 80,000 home care packages and will reduce the wait list and give more seniors the opportunity to live in the comfort of their home for longer. As part of this allocation, 40,000 home care packages will be delivered in 21-22 and a further 40,000 in 22-23, which will make a total of 275,598 packages available to senior Australians by June 2023, Mr President. Our commitment and investment is already paying off for senior Australians. Between December 2019 and December 2020, home care packages increased by 19 per cent to 173,495 packages. As of the 31st of May this year, Mr President, I'm happy to report that 189,369 people have access to a home care package. Mr President, this government is committed to showing senior Australians the care, dignity and respect they deserve. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate how senior Australians in rural and regional areas, including regional Victoria, will benefit from this record investment? Senator Colbeck. Order. Senator Thank you, Colbeck, Mr President. Please. Senator O'Neill, I'm going to insist that, that the completely inappropriate interjections that are always in breach of standing orders don't start before the minister gets to their, seat, their feet to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. I thank Mr President. Senator Polly. Uh, the Morrison government's $17.7 million billion dollar investment in aged care includes more than $630 million to improve the access to quality aged care services for senior Australians in regional, rural and remote areas, including special needs groups. Mr President, this targeted investment will support communities identifying as being most in need. To ensure Commonwealth Home Support Program services remain accessible to all eligible senior Australians, providers are required to be as responsive as possible Order. to requests from senior Australians and their carers for short-term or ongoing home support Senator services. Seward. To access services, senior Australians, their family or carers can con contact My Aged Care for advice to arrange an assessment of their aged care needs. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline the government's long-term plan for aged care through the recently announced $17.7 billion investment in the budget? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thank you, Senator Henderson, for your question. And you're right, the government recently handed down a $17.7 billion package to deliver once in a generation reform Order. of age, the aged care sector in response to the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety Senator final report recommendations. Senator Mr President, this package announced in the budget is the largest investment in aged care and the largest response ever to a Royal Commission. Mr. President. Order. The focus through our aged care reforms is to ensure senior Australians have access to high quality and safe services are empowered to have more control and their choice of their care arrangements and are treated with the dignity and respect they res deserve, Mr Order. President. Every year, under a coalition government, home care packages are up, residential, uh, residential home care places are up and Order. every year Senator aged Colbert, care funding time is time for the up. answer has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister explain to Australians who, for the last 15 months, have been unable to visit dying loved ones overseas, have been stranded overseas and have been separated from their children, why the Prime Minister gets a leave pass to visit Cornwall and pay respects to his ancestors? Order. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, well, if Senator Watt really thinks that was the purpose of the Prime Minister's visit, then he pays even less attention to what's going on than I thought was actually possible. Mr. President, as the Prime Minister made clear, and indeed sides. as I've referenced in this chamber, as Senator Payne Order. has referenced in this chamber, you'd have thought Senator Watt Senator might have been Watt. listening on any of those occasions. The Prime Minister, whilst at the G7, Order. secured Watt. the Australia-UK so, free trade agreement. Please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. 
Um, I, I am not particularly annoyed at the lack of respect shown to me, but this place will become unmanageable if I call senators to order and they don't even have a modicum of respect for the standing orders. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the Prime Minister secured the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement yeah, yeah, of yeah. huge importance to Australian farmers, of huge importance to Australian businesses, of huge importance to ensuring that Australians continue to enjoy the opportunity of more jobs, of more economic Order. growth, the sorts of things that our Senators side of politics Aaron has McKim. delivered for them. Those opposite want to demean the opportunities created by trade and such agreements. They want to demean the opportunities created by the discussions the Prime Minister had, for example, with President Biden and Prime Minister Johnson about the opportunities to talk about the strategic challenges faced in our region and around the world. Very serious challenges, very important discussions that, of Order. course, saw during that, uh, during that time the NATO countries meet and issue statements in relation to China and the challenges we face. The Prime Minister, as well, took the opportunity to engage in bilateral discussions with a number of his different counterparts. Already in this question time, if Senator Watt had been paying any attention, I referenced the fact that hydrogen agreements were signed during the recent trip with Germany, with Singapore, decarbonisation agreements Senator signed. That's it. And this is why Senator Watt Order. doesn't actually remember any of these things, because he doesn't shut up during, during the debate. Order. He doesn't ever listen to any of it. Motormouth Murray over Senator there just Watt. doesn't know Senator when to be quiet, Wald. Mr President. Order. He doesn't know when to be quiet. He won't pay any attention Order. to the achievements. He won't pay any attention to what's accomplished. Time for the answer has expired. Order. I repeat again, it's going to be a particularly long week if it is this noisy. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Question. We've obviously touched a nerve. <laughs> not mine, Senator Watt. Not yours, Mr President. On me. No, Senator no, Watt. He's not, he's Why did the Prime Minister pretend this was an unplanned side trip when we know that he had already commissioned the St Cavern Local History Society to research his family tree? Wow. The Prime Minister wouldn't be telling fibs now, would he? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, Mr. President, I, I reject the premise of the question, but, but Mr. President, you would think, Order. in the midst of a global All right. pandemic, Order. all right, that's Senator Birmingham, please. Senator Watt, I can't hear a word Senator Birmingham is saying with you screaming across the chamber like that. Senator Wong on a point of order. Relevance in the midst of a global pandemic, maybe hanging out, going or going off to on a Senator side Wong, trip to visit your ancestors. Order, Senator Wong, please resume your seat, Senator Wong. That is not a point of order. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of a recession, in the order. midst of a recession, order. you've got a situation where our Senator government. This government Order. has helped to ensure Australia's Order. health outcomes Senator are some Birmingham. of the best Senator in the Wong. world. Senator Australia's Wong. economic outcomes are some of the best in the world. You'd think that those opposite might care about the jobs of Australians and want to ask questions to about that. But no, they don't. You'd think they might care about the security of Australians and want to ask questions about that. But no, they don't. Do they come in from all of the different meetings and discussions the Prime Minister had when he was overseas and ask about any of those? No, they don't. They're just obsessed with the pettiness. They're obsessed with the smear. What they want to do, of course, is try to win the next election on smear, not policy. Well, we will stand on policy. We will stand on a record of record jobs, of economic growth, of keeping Australians safe, because they're the things Senator that matter Watt. to Australians. Order, order. Senator Wong, you used the term in reference to an individual that is unparliamentary. I ask you to withdraw. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. When Australia was on fire, Scott Morrison ran off to Hawaii. When his vaccine Order, rollout Senator fell apart, McGrath. the Prime Minister Order, Scott Senator Morrison McGrath. went sightseeing in Cornwall, something no other Australian can do. Why is it that when the going gets tough, Mr Morrison goes on holiday? Senator Henderson, I'm going to ask though, order. I have asked order. I'm trying to call those on my right to order, Senator Watt. I have asked those on my left to respect the standing orders during answers. I will ask those on my right to respect the standing orders during questions. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it's the Senator for Smear over there and the opposition tactics completely laid bare. 
their tactics for the next election Order. are just all about smear, all about denigration. They're not going to bother bowling up any policies. They won't ever come clean on whether or not they'll implement lower taxes for Australians. Indeed, we know that taxes will end up being higher Order. for Australians. They won't talk about the substantive issues that Australia faces. They will just engage in the type of dirt digging and smear that they think might get them a cheap headline. Well, on this side, we will continue to stand on our record. We are proud of the fact that Australia's economy is bigger now than it was pre-pandemic and that we are the only economy in the advanced world to have achieved that outcome. We are proud of the fact that more Australians are in jobs today than was the case prior to the pandemic and we were the first advanced economy in the world to achieve that. We are proud of the fact that most of those jobs coming back have gone to Australian women. We're proud to see full-time jobs Senator coming back, Birmingham and that lot don't seem to care. The answer has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Order. President. My question... Order. Senator Wong, Senator Hughes is on her feet. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Could the minister update the Senate on how the childcare system in Australia is supporting women's participation in the workforce? The minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for the question and for your passion and commitment uh, for the childcare sector. Supporting the economic security of women is a key and enduring priority for this Morrison government. This is, why, this is why we are addressing the barriers to women's workforce participation through record childcare funding. This funding sees $10.3 billion being spent this year, including $9 billion to subsidise the fees set by childcare services. In 2018, the Morrison government overhauled the childcare system to introduce one childcare subsidy, offering more support for families with lower incomes who needed it and, and also basing hours of subsidised care on family activities. Three years on, Australian families remain the beneficiaries of this government's childcare policies. And in this year's budget, we went further. We announced an additional $1.7 billion to further help Australian families with more than one child, five and under, in those years that are the toughest on the hip pocket for families. By increasing the subsidy for families with a second Senator or third child, five and under, 250,000 Australian families will be better off. This support, uh, will, this support will assist second income earners in a family, often women, who want to return to work and work additional hours. Women's workforce participation has reached a record high of 61.8 per cent under this government, and that is something we are incredibly proud of. And we continue to put in place measures to support women who choose to work or to work more hours in the workforce. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What benefits will families and the broader economy experience from the Morrison government's childcare measures. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President, and thanks again, Senator Hughes. This one budget measure alone will support around 250,000 Australian families each and every year. And these are the families who need it the most. These families will benefit for up to $183 per week for their second child and any further child in the family under five and who is also in care. This means that these families will be better off by $2,260 per year. That is a great outcome for these families. We're also removing the annual cap on subsidies of $10,560 a year, which, is cu which currently only applies to families earning over $189,390. This measure will benefit around 18,000 families and means no family will have an annual cap on their childcare subsidies. Our targeted Order, measures Reynolds, tackle workforce time for the answer has expired. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's record childcare funding has delivered access to childcare services 
and supported economic opportunity since first elected. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much again for the question. Today, over 280,000 more children are in childcare, and women's workforce participation has reached a record high, as I've said, of 61.8 per cent in March of this year, which was up from 58.7 per cent when Labor last left office. And let's never forget, when Labor were in government, fees went up 53 per cent including a one-year spike of 14.5 per cent. And now, under Labor's so-called universal childcare, a family earning a half a million dollars would receive 50,000 of taxpayers' money for two children in full-time childcare. This universal childcare means they, they really don't care if parents are working to be eligible, and they don't really have faith in parents actually deciding what is right for their families. Again, Order. just Senator remember, Reynolds, under this government, we have kept... has expired. Senator Reynolds was... Um, Senator Farrell jumped beforehand, um, and the leader of the... Um, well, Senator Birmingham... And I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Sorry. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Reynolds and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Green and Keneally. Well, I, more than anyone in this chamber, I think, knows how good a place regional Queensland is. I spent an awful lot of time in there, many family members there, and even just over the last five years, I've got to see the fantastic industries, the fantastic people, the fantastic natural environment that regional Queensland has. But for all of that benefit, regional Queensland also has significant challenges. Uh, it needs more jobs. It needs more job security. It needs a government that once and for all will tackle the scourge of casualisation and labour hire that is endemic across regional Queensland. It needs reef infrastructure and regional Queensland it needs health services. Now, if you thought that there was any political party represented in this place that would be more concerned about those issues and what regional Queensland really needs, you would think it would be the National Party. You would think it would be the party that holds itself out as being the voice of farmers, of being the voice of regional communities, of being the voice and the advocate for all of those kinds of issues that I've just talked about. But what we've seen over the last few days, particularly today, is the worst rerun of a television program you can ever imagine. That's right, we had yet another Nationals leadership squabble. I've lost count of how many leadership squabbles there have been in the National Party, even in the five years that I've been here. We were reflecti reflecting before we've had the Abbott Trust, Turnbull Trust, Turnbull, McC uh, Turnbull McCormack, or was there someone in between? There was the Morrison McCormack. Now we're back to the Morrison Joyce. There's probably some combination in there that I can't even remember. There's been so many changes within the National Party because they are so obsessed with fighting themselves rather than doing anything about any of those issues that I've just listed that are of real concern to people in regional Queensland. Where are the National Party when we actually need more jobs in central Queensland or anywhere across Queensland? Where are the Nationals when we need something actually done about casualisation and labour hire in the mining industry? You can't count on the Nationals to be there. They're too busy dressing up for their next leadership challenge. That's what the Nationals are spending their time on. The Nationals have just become a bunch of babies, a bunch of children squabbling over a toy. It's like Barnaby's on the one hand with one hand on that toy. I want it, I want it, I want it. And then you've got Michael McCormack. I want it, I want it, I want it. You've got Matt Canavan in between trying to pull one leg out. Senator you've White, got Bridget McKenzie pulling Senator another White, off. I remind you to refer to uh, other senators and MPs by their correct titles. Thank you. You've got every... Thank you, Madam Deputy President. You've got every member of the National Party and every senator from the National Party in their squabbling trying to pull the toy of the National Party leadership apart all the while, regional Queenslanders are left in the lurch, looking for jobs, 
looking for job security, looking for an end to casualisation and labour hire, looking for decent, decent health services, looking for infrastructure, all the kind of things that the National Party should actually be focusing on. Now, to give their credit, the outgoing leader of the National Party, Mr McCormack, joined by the member for Capricornia, Michelle Landry, today admitted that people in regional Queensland don't want to see the Nationals have another leadership challenge, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But that's exactly what Mr McCormack and Ms Landry's colleagues have served up again today. When regional Queenslanders are wondering when they're going to get their vaccine from this government, instead they get another leadership challenge. When regional Queenslanders are wondering when the National Party will finally do something about casual and labour hire, casualisation and labour hire, they get another leadership challenge from the National Party. And that's what we know lies ahead, because it happens every six months or so. We have leadership after leadership challenge in the National Party, while all these issues in regional Queensland get ignored by the party that claims to represent them. Now, it's all coming to a head, of course, over what this government's policy is around emissions. Uh, if, if anyone knows what this government's position is on net zero emissions is, please come and explain it to me, because I certainly don't know, and I don't think anyone in Australia knows either. We've got the, we've got the, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, claiming that he wants to get to net zero emissions, preferably by 2050. We've got the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, out there saying that, we, that the Mr Morrison has already committed to net zero emissions by 2050. But, of course, we've got Mr Pitt and any number of other National Party members saying that's not the government's position. And in fact, when we were asking Senator Birmingham uh, and other ministers about this today to, to, to agree that the government's position is to get to net zero emissions by 2050, preferably, who was sitting over there shaking her head? but the leader of the Nationals in the Senate, Senator McKenzie. The Nationals have not signed up to this. Thank we do you, not Senator know what the White, government's position is. Has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. Um, how quickly those opposite forget about uh, squabbles and changes. I, I seem to remember uh, some prime ministers, was it Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, some squabbles over that side too, over some similar sorts of uh, issues, I, I suspect. But I'm glad, very glad, that Senator Watt has asked uh, about jobs, because I think it was uh, very telling you know, with the um, what we just saw with the, uh, our most recent jobs figures, which I'm just pulling up now for Senator Watt, but he's sadly left us. So it was easy to see that employment surged in by 115,000 jobs in May to a record high. And these are across regions, these aren't just in the big cities. Full-time employment rose 97,500 to a record high. The Unemployment rate fell by 0.4 per cent to 5.1 per cent in May, and the participation rate rose by 0.3 per cent to 66.2 per cent. So it's very clear, in answer to Senator Watt, that we are creating jobs, whether in his regional Queensland, whether in regional Victoria, where I am the proud senator of. We are creating jobs in record numbers that that side of politics has never, ever been able to do. Now, he was also asking uh, about our vaccine rollout strategy. Well, it's a, it's a very good question, and I'm happy to be able to um, update him on some of those numbers as well, as well as you know, the goals about net zero zero by 2050. Because, as those opposite know, the only target of the Paris Agreement requires is a 2030 target which we have, and we're yet to hear from those opposite about what theirs is. And so while the, this morning the Leader of the Opposition was ducking and weaving about what your 2030 target would be, we have committed to and, and uh, on our way to achieving our, net, uh, our targets for 2030. And we have runs on the board for this. We beat our target for Kyoto by, um, I think the number was 439 million tonnes, I think it was, Madam Deputy President. I'd have to, uh, I'll come back to the House, uh, to the Senate if, if I'm wrong on that, but I believe it was about that. 459, thank you, Senator Rennick. So that's why our approach is, is working. It's driven by how, not the when. And this is the problem. 
There is no one that can tell us how to get to net zero by 2050. The technologies that will get us there don't currently exist. Now, other countries may be able to say that because they have powers such as, Nuclear. what was that other one that uh, we Nuclear. talk about a lot on this side? Nuclear. Nuclear power. Now, that may be something that we have in Australia in, in the future, but we don't currently have it now. No more than we have, no, no more than we have hydrogen power in commercial quantities. And I'll take any interjection that, uh, that Senator Ayres wants to give us, but uh, Madam, Deputy President, uh, Madam Deputy President, you might want to pull up those interjections, that being your job. So we are doing so much with being able to pull together, pulling down net, our net zero emissions. Our vaccine rollout is going exactly as, as it should be. We are being able to manage the economy better than those opposite ever could. So I think it's very clear that it, you know, from that side of politics, particularly Senator Watt and Senator Ayres, love to come in here and chuck around little jokes and, and you know, slurs on those on this side that rarely get pulled up. But can their side of politics claim any goals at all? What are they going to do with, with Paris? What's your Paris goal? What's your roadmap? You're just going to use renewables? You're only going to put up more wind towers, more solar panels? We're not hearing anything about the details on that. Yep, and the response that your side gives us has the same effect on me, Mr. Senator Ayres. Bores me to tears and makes me yawn like you just did. So I think it's easy to um, say. Senator Van, I would remind you not to reflect on other senators. You can speak about Senator I was making an observation, person. Madam. And you, may, you make President. it to the chair, not directly to senators. Please continue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have no doubt that you will we'll give us that, Senator Ayres. But uh, I, I thank the opposition for their time and, and, and Senator Ayres for his entertainment. And I look forward to it being, being returned in kind. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Ayres. Well, may we say Australians all let us rejoice. Uh, but I'm sure the response from people all around the country is going to be, it's going to be, must we? Really? Rejoice? Um, eight years of tired, dysfunctional government with no plan for the future with a track record of the lowest productivity growth in 50 years, no plan on climate and energy. What have we had? As Senator Watts said, we've had Abbott and Truss, we've had Turnbull and Truss, we've had Turnbull and Joyce, we've had Turnbull and McCormack, we've had Morrison and McCormack, and now we're back with Morrison and Joyce. Eight long years of tired, ineffective government, entirely focused on itself, entirely focused on itself. This government has become much worse under the current Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. Its tendency for secrecy, its obsession with marketing, its requirement for spin at all costs, its capacity for deflection, when the country needed something more, when the country needed leadership to fix this tired old mess of a government, who did the National Party turn to? Who did the National Party turn, on, turn to when we really needed to focus on the interests of regional Australians? Well, they've given us poor old Mr Joyce. And why isn't there anybody in the National Party, here in the Senate, in here defending Mr Joyce? Why isn't there anybody in the National Party on their feet in this debate? I'll tell you why. Because they're all on the telephone. They're all on the telephone, ringing around, interested in the only jobs that they've got any interest in at all, their own jobs. Where's Senator McKenzie? She's in there lobbying to make sure she gets a job out of this. Where are the other National Party senators? In corridor meetings trying to make sure they squeeze something out of this tired, incompetent government in terms of jobs for themselves, the only jobs that they are interested in. 
I mean, poor old Mr Joyce, his Christmas message. As a backbencher, he was still putting out Christmas videos. In Christmas 2019, he had this sort of deranged, beetroot-faced video that he sent out from some paddock out the back of Walker, and he said, look, I just don't want the government anymore in my life. I'm sick of the government being in my life. Well, not anymore. He's going to get plenty of the government in his life. He's going to get plenty of it. He's looking forward to the big salary. He's looking forward to the ministerial cars. He's looking forward to lots of staff and to throwing his weight around, throwing his weight around all the corridors of Canberra. But I tell you what, the people who miss out, like always, are going to be the people of regional Australia. And poor old Darren Chester, first to Ms. get the uh, chop. Senator Ayres. Poor old Mr Chester. Thank you. Poor old Mr Chester, former Minister Chester, we're told. The only decent person in that bunch of clowns looking for a radio. The only one who's shown any decency over the course of the last eight years of this miserable, incompetent government. He's first to get the chop. Because the people surrounding Mr Joyce are going to make sure they get what's coming to them out of this leadership change. Well, Mr Joyce left with very serious allegations surrounding him uh, during the short period that Mr Turnbull was in office. They have not been satisfactorily dealt with. Despite finding that the allegations brought by Ms Marriott, that she was forthright, believable, open and genuinely upset, the National Party in its investigation into itself said, unable to make a determination. And what's driven this change? Well, I tell you what, again, it's all about climate change like it always is. The only thing that this is going to do is improve the old podcast industry. Well, I'm not sure whether it's weatherboard that's been deleted or iron. But, but poor old Mr Joyce, it'll be very Thank interesting you, to Senator see whether he Ayers, continues your his time podcast. Has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And what a time to be alive. It never had before the forces between darkness and evil been more clear than here today. What we've had today here is nothing but a session, a bile session of putrid personal smears. A putrid personal smears talking about a fantasy target of net carbon, net zero uh, emissions by 2050 net zero 20 emission, uh, emissions by 2050. And we've got Senator Watt, who's got the audacity to come in here and talk about regional Queensland. Talk about regional Queensland and somehow blame the Nats for everything that's gone wrong in regional Queensland. Well, let me tell you something, acting, acting Madam Deputy President. State Labor is responsible for the destruction uh, of Senator regional Rennick, Queensland. Senator resume your seat, please. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Senator Vorder, uh, you are the Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator McCarthy. Sorry, Senator Rennick. Apologies for that. You in the full Apolog apologies to apologies to for that. Go. And you know, wh where do we start? You know, when it comes to regional Queensland, what what we've got here is state Labor government who sold privatised nearly all of the assets that the state government owns: Queensland Rail, uh, Golden Casket, the forestry plantations, the Port of Brisbane. Six times earnings they sold the Port of Brisbane, a monopoly. The six times earnings, a 99-year lease. And they wonder why the state of Queensland is going broke. But what I want to know is how exactly... I'll tell you what our policy, by the way, is when it comes to energy. It is cheap and reliable energy that is going to create jobs in the manufacturing sector. Not in the inputs, not in the cost sector of creating energy. No, 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 no. We had the world's cheapest energy when Labor came to power in 1990 from the world's best coal. But that's all been destroyed thanks to mismanagement by the Queensland Labor government mismanagement by the Queensland Labor government and the fact that they now subsidise foreign companies to come to Queensland. They pay foreign companies to come to Queensland and generate renewable energy. Now, Queensland coal-powered fire stations and gas power stations have the potential to generate 13 gigawatts of energy a day. The most Queensland's ever used is nine gigawatts. In order to meet their 50 per cent target, they are going to add another 20 gigawatts of renewable energy despite the fact that they don't need it, because we already have sufficient supply to meet demand. 
But what they're going to do is they're going to drive our energy that the Queensland owned, the last thing the Queensland, the Queensland Labor government didn't sell, the Queensland owned energy uh, companies, uh, they are going to drive them into the ground. And last year was the first year that the Queensland energy companies lost a billion, one and a half billion dollars because they had to get turned off all the time while the foreign owned renewable companies had the opportunity to make money. Had the opportunity to make money. Now, you know, if, if, and the other thing is all, all this you know, wonderful talk about net zero 50, blah, blah, blah. You know who's doing the heavy lifting in this country when it comes to reducing emissions? Are our farmers and the reduction in land use. Now, I just want to quote some figures here across Australia of how much money is being invested in reducing carbon emissions. In New South Wales, there's $630 million being invested in reducing carbon emissions. Uh, in Victoria, a measly $15 million. ACT, nothing. Uh, in WA, $109 million. And Northern Territory, $38 million. But in Queensland, there's $886 million being invested in buying back land, locking up land, agricultural land, in order to reduce carbon emissions. And do you know where the bulk of that is? In my turf, the Darling Downs in the southwest where we've got $523 million. That's almost as much as the entire amount of New South Wales and more than the rest of the other states can combined. So this is typical, walk the walk, talk the talk. Labor love to talk the talk, but they never come to walk the walk, all these inner city people that want to reduce emissions. So when are they going to start riding their push bikes to work? When are they going to stop taking aeroplane flights? When are they going to turn their air conditioning off? Rather than pushing farmers in southwest Queensland out of jobs, when are they going to actually start walking the walk for a change instead of dictating to everyone else on what should happen? And as for meeting 2050, why should this country be subservient to other nations? Who can well remember the Hawke-Keating government when Hawke took the states to the High Court in 1983 to block Franklin Dam, the Franklin Dam, the building of the Franklin Dam? Now, had that dam been built, that was carbon-free energy. And you know what Tasmania did for the rest of the 80s? They voted against Labor. And you know what ta how Tasmania is going now? Since they have allowed more dams and weirs to be built, they're the second grow uh, strongest economy now in the country, thanks to building of dams. But do we see that in Queensland? No, we don't. What's the state government doing? They're ripping down our own dams. They're ripping down Paradise Dam. That's a carbon-free source of energy if they put a generator on the end of it. But no, 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 no. They're happy to pull down Australian-made, Australian-owned clean energy and then pay foreigners to actually produce energy that, after all, isn't all that clean because it's come up with solar panels and batteries and wind turbines that can't be recycled. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, I rise to take note of the answers given by uh, Minister Reynolds to questions without notice asked by Senators Green and Keneally uh, relating to the new Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce. So let's just look across, this, you know, across the chamber at this crew. They're unable to roll out vaccines. They're unable to roll out quarantine. But Nationals rolled out the grand old man to put in yesterday's man. What, a, what an indication of where this crew is up to. You know, look at these sorts of questions that we have now in front of us. You know, this, at the day when we've got this crisis, again, uh, reoccurring with COVID-19 cases, where exposure sites across New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, on a day when an emergency national cabinet meeting has been convened, on a day where the premiers of multiple states, both Liberal and Labor, are sounding the alarm about a shortage of Pfizer vaccines, the coalition government thought it was a good time to have a leadership spill again. The government can't roll out a vaccine, as I say, to save a life or the lives of Australians but they are experts at rolling out their leaders. It was only February of last year that the Nationals last had a spill motion. So as the Australian people are wondering what their elected members of parliament and senators have been doing in the last 18 months, well, in Canberra, you'll, you'll be very surprised. What they've been doing is looking after themselves. The Australian government, as people were curious about by the federal government about can't organise a vaccine rollout, can't organise a quarantine system, can't grow wages for Australian middle class, predicting wage decline in Ford estimates. And now we know one of the reasons why. Because one half of the coalition government has spent the last 18 months plotting and scheming among themselves. 
Instead of doing the job they are paid so handsomely to do, to come to Canberra and do. Today I'm thinking particularly of Australians living in regional communities, areas where the nationals are supposed to be represent this place. I'm thinking of coal miners in the Illawarra, the Hunter and in Queensland, who are being shoved into labour hire jobs on lower pay without any entitlements or job security. While the nationals come to Canberra and masquerade as the coal miners' friends, all the while voting for a bill to overturn the federal court's decision that labour hire coal workers are entitled to basic employment rights. The Nationals voted to strip those rights away. Now, I'm thinking that workers and families in regional areas depend on the agriculture um, sector, that there should be good paying, secure jobs in sectors like horticulture in our regions. And instead, under the National Party, these jobs are reserved for exploited migrant workers. In fact, just last week, the Liberal National Government announced a new agricultural visa aimed at importing and exploiting workers from Southeast Asia. And that visa reportedly will be less regulated than the Pacific Seasonal Workers Program. The British know that these schemes are exploitive. That's why they just negotiated with the Prime Minister to get an exemption from it. Last week, I met with a Taiwanese woman named Kate, who was paid just $4 an hour picking oranges on a farm in Renmark, South Australia. She said, I quote, I went dumpster diving to find food in, uh, in recycled bins at supermarkets when I didn't have enough money. This is the sort of economy that the Nationals promote in regional Australia. When bad employers can't pay migrant wages $4 an hour and force them to eat out of the bin, how are Australian workers in regional communities supposed to get a decent paying job? Of course, the exploitive nature of mining and agriculture isn't the reason we have yet another Nationals leadership spill. It's just a petty internal politics to restore yesterday's man in a position he has already proven himself until, uh, unfit at once, for, at one point. As yet another sign of the tired, bloated, incompetent government and it's failed to turn around and make sure that regional Australia and all Australians during this most difficult period have proper leadership, considered leadership and a leadership that's focused very much on making sure that Australians are better off, not what they've proposed, but Australians are being, going to be worse off. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer, well, should I say non-answer, from the Leader of the Senate, representing the Treasurer in this place, for his non-answer on my questions about Statement 3 around charity law. And I'm deeply distressed that he couldn't answer it because this Statement 3 will have a significant impact on charities in this country. And make no mistake, the government knows, because it's been told, and I'll read out some quotes in a minute from some of the organisations that will be affected, the government knows it's going to have an effect on charities in this country, which is exactly why they're doing it. It's exactly why they are trying to browbeat, bully, threaten charities into not taking up advocacy, into not doing their work. The Community Council of Australia, in its submission to the draft, the exposure draft of Statement 3, says the proposed changes to the ACNC governance standards will diminish our democracy, exactly what the government wants to happen. They will silence some charities by creating fear about potential repercussions. They will impose new limits on staff and others involved in charities and their capacity to express a view. They will impose significant new regulatory burdens on many charities. Keep them busy doing regulation, the very thing the government said they were trying to cut, but keep them busy, keep them busy trying to, with new regulations, new bureaucracy. They will not achieve their policy purpose. They will diminish the capacity of our communities to voice their concerns. They also point out 
that threatening increased enforcement action against charities that, they, that support public campaigns and protest action is not going to make government stronger, quite the contrary. And I sincerely and truly support that statement because good policy is made with the advocacy of people at the front line, of the advocacy of civil society. And that was acknowledged in this place when the laws were passed around the ACNC in 2013 and specifically written into that law was the capacity for charities to advocate, to take up the case to government when they've got it wrong or not putting in place good policy, to particularly campaign for the most vulnerable in our community, to particularly complain and advocate for good environmental protection. And let's face it, this is what the government's at. They don't want people raising these issues. That's why they're trying to change standard three. Now, in the EM on this standard three, on the draft standard three, the government claimed that they're implementing the recommendations of the expert panel on the ACNC, looking into how, in fact, they could improve the law. And they said repeal statement three. So they're, damn, they're, they're not telling the truth in their EM because they were recommended to remove standard three. Yes, to improve some elements of the law, because all I'm not saying that some of it could not be improved, as was pointed out by the expert panel. But what this government's doing is taking the opportunity to browbeat charities, to make them frightened to speak up, to in fact put in, put in summary, uh, sum, sum, summary charges when they're not proven. They're trying to curtail actions and take action against charities for something that's not proven, trying to make the ACNC a, commis a commissioner, the commissioner, make judgment what's unlawful or not when they have the criminal law where charities have broken the law and they have statement five. This is blatantly an attack on charities. The implications of the, of the proposed changes will have, as many organisations have said, a chilling effect on the work of charities in this country, exactly what the government wants. The government have been aiming to wind back and undermine charities again and again and again. And they've got form here. They have used to have gag clauses, gag clauses in funding agreements with charities that said they couldn't speak out. They could, they could support the most vulnerable, provide services mop the brow, as they say, but not advocate for policy change. This is exactly what the government's doing, trying to deliver on their long-term aim to gut charities, to silence charities, to gag charities and stop advocacy. That's what they're on about. The charities know it and it's ha it is already having a chilling effect. Have a read for those that are interested in what the Law Council says. It's very questionable whether this is constitutional or not. And I bet if this gets through, and I'll do the, my hardest to stop it getting through, if it does get Thank through, you, there'll Senator be constitutional Seawitt. Your challenge. time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. <clears throat>